This is a talk about hacking acorn machines, or the bad old days, or my misspent youth, and is all about what I got up to as a teenager. So, first of all, what do I mean by hacking? There are two schools of thought on whether the hacker versus cracker debate, which I am absolutely not going to get into, but given that this is a security conference, there will be splits. So, does anyone remember these guys? If you did not grow up in the UK in the 80s or 90s, you may not have run into these, but these were BBC Micros, they were in primary schools throughout the land, and a lot of people cut their teeth on them as an introduction to computers. And Acorn were, Acorn were the company who made the BBC Micro, but they were also pioneers in the field of networking. And they had a thing called Econet, or Econet. I am not sure. They, I think, given that uh, this was one of their promotional materials, <laughs> that they were probably going for the eco part, the low cost, but in my world it has always been Econet. So... I do not know, but they were playing with this from the early 80s. They were playing, they were developing this in like 1980, 1981, before even the BBC Micro had existed. You'll note that uh, these little schematic machines at the bottom were not in fact BBC Micro Micros, they were Acorn Atoms, which was the predecessor to the BBC Micro. So they were doing networking before people knew what networking was. And because they were big in education, a lot of schools also had networks of these machines. And I got to play with them. And... Um, where am I going with this? What have we got? This is how they did networking in the 80s. These are a bunch of what are called immediate packets, which you could send from one station to another, and it would do something. And if you look at this command list, you will think, this doesn't look like the command list for any network protocol you know. This looks more like the command list for a debugger. You can peek and poke bytes on a remote machine. That JSR you see there is jump to subroutine, so you can execute arbitrary code by poking bytes into your machine, your target, and jumping there. It also has facilities for stopping, for single stepping, and so on, which I'm sure was incredibly useful when they were developing all of this, but arguably has no place in a classroom full of eight-year-olds. But it was fun. They had things, they had built in facilities that allowed you to take remote control of another computer. Its keyboard would be locked out, and your keyboard would send input to it, and you would get to see the screen that it produced. And the way that they did this is they did not have the ROM space to implement any of this on the machines themselves. Instead, they use this remote code execution to send over code and have it running on the remote machine. And the only way that you were expected to keep your classroom chaos free is mm -hmm. by declining to host the utilities that did this on the shared network file server. People... Networks were closed. They're concept that you would introduce things from outside to either... I mean, machines did not have disk drives. The entire point of having a network is that you did not need a disk drive per machine because disk drives were expensive. So you basically had one single shared file store. And if the utilities to do all of the fun stuff were not available on it, then you were basically out of luck. Unless you were to do things like take your walk no longer class and load things from tape. 
But this is just a side note. I am not going to talk about Echonet on the Beep because it is before my time. I did get to play with it a little bit, but this is just an indication to set the scene. This is what they were doing in the 80s. This is what they were doing in the 90s. They had moved on from the 8-bit machines. As you may know, Acorn were behind the ARM architecture, and this was the RISC PC introduced in 1994, which was a 32-bit machine running an ARM 610, which was ARM v3? No, ARM v4. And these things typically had uh, 5 megabytes of RAM and uh, a couple of hundred megs of hard disk. And when I was at boarding school, I returned from summer break in 1994 to find that we had acquired a room full of 10 of them. And I thought they were better than bread, be it sliced or otherwise. And I had a whole lot of fun with them over the years, and I am going to show you how. So first of all, these things were networked. They, uh, Acorn's original Econet, or Econet, was basically a glorified serial link. They had moved on from this by then. They had seen the direction that industry was headed, and everything was now running over bog standard 10 base 2. At the link layer, at the software layer, they were still using the Econet protocol tunnel over UDP, I believe. Well, certainly they did have a tunneling over UDP. They may also have had a tunneling over raw Ethernet. I don't know. I didn't actually understand that layer at the time. Instead, I'm going to talk about some of the higher layers, such as the file server. So, first things first. This is a quote from the Level 4 File Server Manager's Guide, which was the software that people ran to provide a file store for users. And I will read it out. It says, to prevent unauthorized people tampering with information stored on the file server, keep the file server station in a locked room. Even if you run the file server on a station without a keyboard and monitor, it is sensible to take this precaution to prevent anyone attaching a keyboard or monitor and so gaining access to files. Did they do this? No, they did not. <laughs> These 10 computers that I mentioned, they were all in the same room. They all had keyboards and monitors. In fact, Acorn did not even sell servers. <coughs> so the file server had more memory than all of the others. It had more disks than the others, all of which were useful. It also had a larger monitor than the others, which was entirely unused because it just sat there. Because if you used it, ViscoS was a uh, cooperative multitasking system. So if you decided that you wanted to use a file server for something, all <coughs> file serving would stop while you were doing something else. So the file server was off limits. But I should mention this is a boarding school I was at. It was possible to get in after hours. Oh, yes. So... I got to play with the file server. And when you load up the file server, you can get to all of people's files. But you can also get to all of people's accounts. And there is an application called Manager that lets you manage the accounts. And here is what it looks like. And you will notice there that the password is displayed as a whole bunch of dashes. I guess they didn't like asterisks. But it turns out they were actually storing pass. They were actually not hashing passwords. They had the plain text passwords available. And they were relying on the GUI to replace the characters in the password with dashes. So approximately two minutes with a window editor turns it into this. So that is all well and good. And I promptly got a list of people's passwords and uh, 
<laughs> two, two minutes with a two minutes with a window editor to get that. I decided that I wanted to be able to get the passwords off without actually having access to the machine because you know people will change the passwords and it's possible that I will not get at the machine again. So there was a facility for sharing a drive read only. So I went around all of the machines in the room and got them to share their entire hard drives over the network, including the file servers. Unfortunately, this manager program would not run over the network. It needed to be run on the file server, which means that if I were to get the passwords out, I would have to crack the password file. The password file looks like this. Those of you who follow me on Twitter, <coughs> there appear to be a few more of you than there were a few weeks ago as as a result of this talk, which is good because I haven't actually posted anything on Twitter for ages except this, which I posted yesterday. I don't know if anyone had a chance to look at, but if you did, then you, know, you will have a head start on what I'm about to say. This is the password file from the level 4 file server, and you will see that it has some usernames that are backwards, and it has a whole bunch of other garbage in there. What do you do with such a thing? It turns out they are using encryption. What encryption are they using? They are using XOR with a constant byte. I should point out this was 1995. <coughs> Unix crypt had been around for 20 years. Why exactly did they do it this way? I have no freaking idea. <laughs> Acorn was notorious for living in their own little world, not taking uh, notice of where the rest of the industry was headed. But it's also worked worth pointing out that Acorn actually sold Unix workstations. They had themselves ported 4.3 BSD to the ARM architecture. So it's not like they didn't know how to do this. They just didn't care. Clearly, they didn't care about defense in depth. They assumed that if you were running a file server, you would keep it locked up. But I have not looked into this, but I would bet good money that passwords are transmitted in plain text or some equally trivial encryption of the network. <sighs> so, that was level 4 file server. <coughs> what have we got next? This is FSLock. This is what they did to ensure that all of the client computers remain usable and that people did not run RMRF on them. This prevented people from writing to the hard disk, except for a single public directory, where people would store files and promptly have them deleted by the next person who came along and was uh, feeling mischievous. So, if I actually wanted to store things, and as a 15-year-old, by and large, the thing that I was interested in is playing games and not having them deleted by the administration, so, I wanted somewhere to store stuff out of public scrutiny, but I couldn't write to the hard disk. Also, it did, it prevented access to the NVRAM or CMOS RAM in Acorn parlance, so you could not reconfigure the machine in any way, which again was annoying. So, it turns out that there was a utility that was shipped with RiskOS which was called ROM patch. Actually, no. Uh, we are not doing ROM patch first. We are doing messages first. The Acorn were, had a big presence in the UK, but they had ambitions of selling overseas, which meant that all user visible strings needed to be translatable. So they had a messages file that you could edit that would allow translations elsewhere. So this is a copy of FSLock's messages file, and it shows the strings at the top. You can see under path two, there is a dollar dot public. Viscos used dots as path separators and dollar means root directory. So this was the top directory of the hard disk and a subdirectory called public. 
and it looked at this message to find out what the translated name of public was in your particular locale. Now, I should point out that FSLock was in wrong, and so you couldn't just go patching it. But it had provisions to make sure that you did not copy it to RAM and run it from there. But the messages file did not. So what you could do is take the original UK messages file, replace the string $.public with dot, remove the public, and suddenly it thinks the entire hard drive is the drive that you can is the directory that you can now write to. So this is how you do it. That is a very small amount of code. It finds the it first of all it copies the messages file to RAM, it pulls out the location of the messages file, it changes one single byte, which that uh, number 10 is ASCII new line. So it puts a new line in place of the P of public. So you now have the string dollar dot and it reinitializes the messages and that worked flawlessly. Other than the fact that it took approximately 300k of RAM because you had to copy the entire messages file. <coughs> This was on a machine with like five megabytes typically, and I thought that was pushing it a little bit. So I went looking for other approaches. And the other approach, the second approach I came up with was ROM patch. It turns out that there is a file shipped with Viscos that fixes up all of the, they had actual mask ROMs at this point. They weren't flash or EPROMs or anything. They were actual mask ROMs and the lead time for mask ROMs is large, so by the time the OS shipped, they had found a whole bunch of bugs in the ROM, and they needed to fix them up somehow, and this is how they did it. I had no idea how it works. I had no idea at the time. I had no documentation to speak of. I basically was figuring this out with a disassembler, a hex editor, and a copy of BASIC. But it's not too hard to figure out what is going on, <coughs> and what is going on is this. You have two, three fields, you have the location, you have the before, and you have after. And what one patch will do is verify that the location contains the contents before, and it will change it to after using some magic, <coughs> which allowed me to do the messages file hack with using approximately zero RAM. But it also allowed me to do a different hack because now I could patch the FSLock module in its entirety. I could just make it be killable because normally if you try to kill it, it refuses because that would defeat the entire point. Um... This is, of course, incredibly version-specific doing it this way. But it turns out that there was an even simpler way I ended up doing, which is that... Let's see what we've got. Yes. There were two ways to kill a module in this class. And by module, think kernel module. There was not a... a big separation between kernel and user space, but there was a separation of sorts. They had an MMU, but they didn't use it much, as evidenced by the fact that I could write a simple basic program to poke into a module and have it work without having to do anything. Um. <coughs> So what we have here is there were when you tried to kill a module and FSLock is the module that we are trying to kill, there is a flag that the operating system sets when it calls the finalization code of the module. And 
if the flag is set, it is a promise by the operating system that this is a temporary shutdown. I am going to shut you down briefly. I'm going to move you around. I'm going to defragment the heap and I'm going to uh, set you all right back up again. This is because their heap was terrible and they had a command called rmtidy which allowed you to reinitialize all the modules, move things down and reclaim the memory that you were otherwise losing to fragmentation. This turned out to be a terrible idea. In fact, it was sufficiently terrible that they later turned it into a no-op in later versions. But the flag remains. So it was possible to pretend to be DOS, lie to FSLock, say, I'm going to shut you down temporarily, and never actually follow through on that. So FSLock thought it had been killed. The OS thought it was still running, albeit that it had removed all its hooks from all of the syscalls and things. And so you ended up with a zombie. And it was very unwise to do anything at all with the zombie. Interacting with it in any way would almost certainly lock up the machine, but that was okay. But more to the point, this was incredibly portable. It would work on any version ever. And I think I had a version that was less than 100 bytes of code at some point. But this is not it. But yes, now I have solved the problem of how I can store things out of public scrutiny. But I wanted more. It is... what else have we got? This. I had not heard of the word rootkit at this point, but that is approximately what I ended up writing, because it turns out that people actually go looking through directory structures, especially if they take up lots of space. So what I did was I made a way to hide things, so the OS no longer acknowledged their existence. And I have a little demo here, <coughs> and let me see if I can play this, and you will see what is going on. But, uh, I will explain it afterwards. Okay, so you see I have a little directory here, which is the multiplication sign, in which I store all my super secret stuff. I'm going to close that, I'm going to run the uh, the special hidden utility. Now I open the directory again and it has vanished. But here is the fun part. I'm going to open the character map. I'm going to create a new directory with a division symbol. And hey presto, it's back. But it's it's not the division. I created a new directory with a division symbol, but that never happened. And now we've got the thing with the multiplication symbol back. So what's happened to the division symbol? And the way this works is, I wanted to do this, the source code's in the background, by the way. Again, there, there is very, very little of it. This hooked the operating system's read directory entry syscall, which is read dir uh, and <coughs> Unix parlance. But it turned out that risk OS sorted its directory entries alphabetically. So when you called reader or its equivalent, you would get back a sorted list. So if you pick something near the end of the character map, I initially picked ASCII 255, which, I'll cha which I later changed for reasons I will tell you shortly then the idea is you walk through the list to see if the thing at the end is your special file name. And if it is, you simply subtract one from the number, the array length. So that saves you actually having to do any modification of the directory entries themselves. You can just change the length field which was really nice and made the code very small. But it turned out that Acorn 
did actual local aware string comparison. And so I don't know if anyone knows that 255 in Latin 1 is a Y with an umlaut over it, which was sorted along with the Ys. And so Z came after that. So I picked something else that was further up that was not an alphabetical symbol that would not be confused. And I ended up with ASC, not ASCII, uh, Latin 1, 215, which is the multiplication symbol. But I picked that at random. Turns out there were later ones, such as the division symbols. Nobody ever used any of these in file names, so it was perfectly safe. But it turned out it was really useful for debugging, because if you're trying to debug something like this, when it's working, you can't actually see the thing. So that made life easier to debug. So I now had a way of storing all of my stuff out of scrutiny, and this was all run on Bootup. But I wanted more. So I do not sadly have code for this still, but I was able to... I had basically zero documentation on any of this, but I was... I had a list of API calls for Econet, and after much experimentation, I figured out a way to send a byte. Just one byte. But that was all you needed. <coughs> and I ended up implementing what was approximately a remote shell, so you could have a task window open on a remote machine that would not appear in the process list, and you could send bytes to it and get bytes back from it. And the latency was terrible, it was about 100 milliseconds, especially if you had lots of output from your command. This did not have any kind of TCP was just a glimmer in people's eye at this point. So if the network was congested, if there was packet reordering, if packets were lost, then your session would behave strangely. But that was all okay. And I was basically able to run commands on any machine in the room, which was all well and good, because by and large I was not trying to be malicious until other people got hold of the program that <sighs> lets you run commands on other people's machines, and by far the most popular thing that people found it amusing to do to other people's machines was to remotely reboot them, which was a single command. In basic, it was sys 6a. <coughs> And there were people who did not know any basic other than that one command for this precise reason. And someone, I think it may have been my friend Kay, I do not know, I don't think it was me, ended up distributing a version of this that looked as though it was sending commands to a remote machine, but in fact executed the commands on your local machine which put paid to that. So yeah, what else we got? That is what life was like. It was very different from a security perspective. It was clear that Acorn's Priorities were make it work and make it robust and make it user friendly and maybe possibly make it secure as a very much an afterthought. And I would like to offer a lifetime supply of aspirin for all of the headaches that I caused to. The uh, administrator of the computer room, who is uh, mm -hmm. called Dr. Kurtak. And. Yeah, how long we got? Pardon? It's very much time. Okay. Yeah, okay. Questions. I'm going to call it that. Uh, does uh, anyone uh, have anything to ask? 
Um, this is a couple of years ago. Uh, this this was about ninety five, ninety six. Yeah. So between ninety five and ninety eight. How did you think this out on the rules of big things? There's a slightly different story. I that sounds like a quite a good forensics. Like, uh, how did you, how, how did you manage to pull this information back into the okay. world? Okay, the source code so I showed. Yeah. The source code I showed you was off a two and a half inch hard drive, two and a half inch IDE hard drive that I had on my own Acorn machine. That I had a two and a half inch to three and a half inch cable that I was able to transfer it onto an IDE machine in about <coughs> 2001. But ironically, I lost that all, that data to a disk crash later, but the original drive from 1996 was still alive, and just last week I was able to load it up and pull the entire 720 megabytes off it, and that is where the code comes from. <laughs> the network screenshots are all from... the soft, This software is all available for download stuff. So I was able to set it up, and in fact I have it running on my laptop, but it is very annoying to run Risk OS on a laptop because it needs all the function keys and all of the mouse buttons. So this hidden video, for example, is something that I created on this machine a couple of days ago. Uh, does that answer your question? It was <laughs> Anyone else? Did the school ever find out? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> As I was saying before, it was approximately two minutes with a window manager to reveal the passwords. It was approximately half an hour with a hex editor to decode the password format, telling the admin his password was Judith Priceless. <laughs> it turns out it was his wife's name I did not know that because it saved me a bunch of time <laughs> lesson here don't uh, have pass don't use your nearest and dearest names as passwords <laughs> anyone else? All right, thanks for coming, folks. <laughs> <laughs>